welcome to my journey into the media world. I uh, hope you're all safe and well. Um, today, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by former Aston Villa Chief Executive Keith Wynas. Keith, how are you doing? Good, dude. Uh, not so bad in these uh, strange times, but yeah, bearing up well. Yeah, and um, I'm just going to touch upon lockdown. Um, what's, how's lockdown life treating you and where are you situated at the moment? I'm uh, up on the Wirral, um, just north of Chester. And uh, like everybody else, I mean, one day seems to be pretty similar to the next. But uh, luckily, football's still on and that keeps us all uh, alive and interested. Yeah, definitely. Um, as, you, as you know, guys on the channel, I'm a massive Aston Villa fan. So we're going to be talking through Keith's, Keith's time at uh, Aston Villa. Um, so t to start off, Keith, I um, just want to get your initial thoughts on when Dr. Tony came calling for you. And what was your initial thoughts when he wanted you? Well, my sort of relationship with Villa goes way back. Um, I actually lived in Solihull and went to school in Solihull when I was uh, much younger, sort of between, I think, about um, 11 to 16. Hmm. So I'd gone to Villa Park quite a few times then. And I, f I remember my very first game was at Villa Park, uh, watching Santos and Pele play at Villa Park, which was hmm. quite amazing. So uh, that, that's how far it goes back. And even when I went to, uh, to Everton, as chief executive, Doug Ellis had asked me to come down and interview for the Villa job, and that was back about 2004. Uh, but I, in the end, uh, I chose the Everton position. And uh, so really, I've, I've had a, a... Villa's always been somewhere around in my life. So when uh, I got to asked by uh, Dr. Jar, or well, actually Mr. Jar, I think is what we should call him, um, then I thought, great. I mean, Villa is a fantastic club. I knew a lot about it. And um, I was very pleased to uh, to come and join it. I'd always felt that there were clubs around like Spurs, Everton, Villa, Newcastle, were all the same sort of size at one time. Mm. And uh, they were all very similar. And so having done the Everton position, I felt I understood the size of the club very well and uh, felt I could offer Villa quite a lot. Yeah, and quite fascinated actually, you mentioned uh, about your time going way back with Aston Villa in the Pele links there with Santos because I'm actually reading a book at the moment called Ticket to the Moon and it mentions about the, that time so just fascinating um, and how disjointed was the club when you arrived of course you know we just suffered relegation and there's a lot of work to be done wasn't there? Well there was I mean it was a massive shock for any club uh, particularly on the scale of Villa uh, to go down and to um, you know suffer that sort of issue because there's instability in the squad. There was no manager in place at the time. There was a new owner coming in. Uh, nobody had any idea what he knew about football. Um, who was he, in fact, in many ways? People didn't really know a lot about him. And so it was a, a big period of instability. And I think you just have to look at Sunderland, you know, who are also a fairly big club, coming down around the same sort of time and look where they are now. And so, you know, it was quite easy for the club to have slipped down considerably. Uh, there was very poor morale in the staff behind the scenes and I think obviously the fan base was uh, was very concerned about what was happening next. So it was a very tricky time to come into the club. Yeah and of course you know the first thing that springs to mind is getting that manager in, in and um, you know getting transfers and getting that transition base um, over the line into the championship but you mentioned there about the um, staff and stuff so what role did you play Obviously, being around the club, what role did you have, not just on the transfers and on getting a new manager in, but really galvanising Aston Villa team and staff again? Well, I think the, the biggest issue was there had to be a lot of cost-cutting that was started to be put in place by the previous management. If you remember, Steve Hollis was uh, the, uh, the CEO in charge of the club for the period of transition uh, with Randy Lerner into, uh, into Jar. And there were a big number of, um, of staff that were, were let go. So it was a big job of actually making sure that uh, the team that was left understood what we had to re, you know, regroup and to, uh, to try and refocus on what was important, that we were a championship club having to live within championship means, which is very different. And so we had to decide whether we were trying to be a premiership club on a sort of a, a bit of a, a lower budget but be prepared to go back up. But that's always got a risk with it because then, you know, if you don't go back up, then you're, you're, uh, you're carrying too much overhead. So it was a tricky balancing act. 
Uh, and so it was to try and bring in some fresh people as well to try and revitalize the club and get something fresh and let the fans see that something was happening again and that we we're prepared to fight and uh, do our best to get back up. Yeah, we mentioned, um, mentioned Mr. Zaria uh, previously um, and you mentioned about the tran transfers and getting the uh, right amount of players in. Um, what was working with Mr. Zaria like with transfers? Because I, you, you can correct me here if I'm right, Keith, but I hear that he was very hands-on with transfers. What was your dealings with him? Well, he always had the final say because in the end it was uh, supposedly his money that was being paid. Um, you know, we had a very clear, um, small team, which I think is always the best way to run a football club between the manager, the sporting director and myself that would make recommendations. Uh, we'd clearly make a recommendation, but he always did have the final say, which is right and proper because I say he's chairman and owner. And so, you know, that was the case. In terms of being hands-on, um, yes, he, he, he started being a bit more hands-on than he ended up being because... I think he started to realise he didn't quite know as much as he uh, he realised. And I think, you know, many years of watching football on TV in China doesn't really qualify you to um, to to take the club forward. And so he started to realise that having football knowledge and uh, people in the game were quite important. Yeah, so in that first season when you had to bring in a whole host of different players, um, were they solely... Dr. Tony's suggestions, or did it come from the likes of you and the manager in Di Matteo? No, it had to come uh, mainly from the manager uh, and myself. The man I mean, I, wherever I've been, uh, the manager is a very important person. Obviously, he has to have the final say, really, in terms of a player he wants to put in the team. But Shah would have a lot of ideas in terms of how he would uh, recommend players or how he would make certain suggestions about key positions. But in the end, it was the manager that would have to make a, a full decision because he'd have to actually uh, put the squad together. Uh, mm. But I'd have to manoeuvre in between the two and try and make the balance. And uh, and then once we decided on a certain target, I'd have to go and try and execute the deal and make sure it worked commercially for us as well. Yeah, can I just touch up on a transfer that didn't go get, get across the line in Abel Hernandez? Um, what went on there? Could you explain a little bit there, please? Yeah, that was pretty simple. He was, was a striker that we did like. Um, I think it was just the same around the same time we got Codger, um, who ended up doing quite well for us. Um, but Hernandez was uh, with an agent, Mina Riola, who is quite famous. I always laugh because Mina got on the phone with me the first day and said, look, Keith, he says, for me, it's not about football. It's all about the money. And uh, he said, look, you know, I just want to make as much money as possible. At least he was honest. And uh, he was asking for about Ninety thousand pounds a week for Hernandez for wages, and it was just that was way out of the ballpark in terms of what we were prepared to do in the championship. But Riola had made it so expensive because he knew that uh, the player would be coming out of contract, and so he was working on what he would be making out of the player the next season. So that's how he came to those sort of numbers. So the deal never went forward. Hmm. And obviously, you had a number of games in the championship, um, but for whatever reason, um, Di Matteo didn't work out. Um, Preston North End was his last uh, game in charge at Aston Villa. My first question to you from the inside, could you put your finger on why it didn't work out for Di Matteo? Well, look, we have to go back to that first transfer window. Um, I think we finished buying the club in the June, so we were already into the transfer window. But still, I had to get 12 players in and 12 players out, which was a, you know, the, and if you work on the theory that for every deal, there's normally five that don't actually happen. Mm. So there's probably about 120 deals we were involved in that period, short period of time. So there was a huge turnover in staff. It was, it was working. We were working 24 seven on that. Um, but so he had a lot of turnover in staff. He had to get a team settled and get them, you know, working right out the blocks. Looking back, I think if I was to look at it again, I don't think perhaps he worked hard enough on that uh, squad. Uh, I don't think he put the hours in to really make it, um, give it the best shot. And I think that started to show on the pitch and we didn't get the results that uh, perhaps some of the performances deserved. And, you know, it was just one of those uh, things that didn't go well for him. And I don't think the staff, you know, the players responded properly to him. And um, that's where we made the decision that um, he had to, uh, you know, to leave. Uh, I think also being Jar's first manager as such, mm. I think perhaps he was 
a bit power hungry and ready to pull the trigger. And uh, at that stage, you know, he had the authority to do it. Yeah, and you mentioned about Jaya pulling the trigger there. Um, from my understanding, that meant the role of sacking Di Matteo was down to you. And it actually, the news actually broke to him at half time at Preston North End. Can you explain what that was like as a chief executive? It wasn't half time, no. We, we never do it at half time in a game. It was, uh, we, conv- we convened with a, uh, a conference call with Ja after the game in a private room at the stadium. Uh, there was just myself, uh, Steve Round, and uh, Ja on the phone with uh, Ja's assistant. And he said he'd made the decision. We talked it through. And then it was left to me to, um, to do the calls to, to make sure that uh, things were communicated properly. Mm. And um, we talked about Jaya there. Is there any um, stories you have working with Jaya? Um, there's one in particular that springs to mind. I've read that um, he, uh, Sheffield Wednesday under Steve Bruce, um, he asked for uh, Len Whelan to be substituted off and he went against that and then he went on to score one of the goals. Is there any um, stories around Jaya that you could tell us? Well, yeah, I mean, that was that was the case that he, at uh, half-time, he sent messages across from China saying that uh, we had to tell Steve uh, that he had to take off two players and that if he didn't, he was going to get sacked. And I wasn't prepared to send that message, and I just knew it was um, wrong to interfere at that level, particularly when somebody's just watching a game, um, you know, on TV in China. So I didn't put that message forward. And uh, yes, as you say, uh, Whelan went on and scored, and we went on to win four-two away at Chef Wednesday. So uh, Jard didn't say much about that after the game, uh, or again, he didn't really interfere in any way after that. I think that was a bit of a lesson for him. Uh, that you have to leave the professionals to handle it. And if they don't handle it properly, then they pay the ultimate price. Uh, but you have to give them all support you can do, uh, try and give them the best chance to win. And if things aren't right, then you make the change. But you know, it's their job on the line, but you have to let them do it. How does Joya compare to, you know, you said you've worked at Everton there and um, Aberdeen, of course. Um, how does he compare to other owners? He was probably the worst I've worked with uh, in terms of um, his limited knowledge of the game and how to handle people. Obviously, in China, I think the employment relationship is very different between employers, employees and employers. And um, he had a very strange view of how to handle relationships. He was always very mysterious and um, we never really understood you know, who he was in the end and uh, where his resources were. So... He was, but you know, I don't always believe he had the uh, the best interests of the club at heart, although he claimed to. I think he enjoyed the whole um, adulation aspect of it very much, the reflected glory of football. Uh, mm. But when it came to it, he really wasn't um, wasn't really on the on the right side of it for the club. Mm. And if we move on to the Steve Bruce tenure, um, what were things like then? Um, obviously, he, he steadied the ship. Were things more settled, or was there still a bit of um, uncertainty during his tenure? Well, again, I mean, look, I had to make a decision about which manager to take in after Di Matteo, and it was pretty clear we needed to, to, set, to settle the ship. I mean, it was at a pretty crucial time, and we were in that first season after going down. And Steve did have the experience. Uh, I knew he was a good man manager of the players and to get the best out of the squad, which he, he did. He settled the squad down, and as we all know, the second season... We were within, uh, you know, what should have been uh, a win at, at Wembley to go back up again. Mm. Uh, so Steve did did a good job, as far as I was concerned, under very difficult circumstances again. Uh, but also his stature and his experience were able to keep um, Ja under control as well to that uh, that degree in that area. Yeah, I feel like uh, in 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 today's when we're talking about today, um, there is a lot of towards the end of uh, his tenure, there was always a lot of negativity surrounding the fans. But, like you said, he steadied the ship and some of the signings he attracted um, helped us in, um, in, in the future with, um, you know, different owners and different manager. There's no um, doubt. I mean, I just, I was very sad to see uh, Conor Hurhan go to Swansea the other day. Uh, Conor was a great acquisition. I thought he did very well for us. Uh, you look at players that uh, we enjoyed at the time, even Albert Adoma, God bless mm. him, scoring uh, 14 goals, I think, one season, uh, and Codger. I mean, you know, they, they gave us some, some pleasure. And there was a decent team, James Chester. Sam Johnston was doing well in goal. 
it was a half decent squad. And as I say, you know, you look back on that playoff game at Wembley, I still think there should be a red card for Fulham for stamping on Jack. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think if it had gone the other way, of course, I and mean, I still look at that and think we should have, we should have gone up. Um, but anyway, it is what it is and that's football. So, um, but Steve, I think did, you know, did a difficult job. Also at the same time, just before the playoffs, I'd seen him have to lose both his parents and I'd mm. seen the personal difficulties he'd had to go through. He was driving up and down to Newcastle continually, but still being thoroughly professional about it and making sure that everything was done the best he could do. But still, that, that sort of thing takes its toll on people. And, uh, you know, always, uh, I'd always say what a, a great man he was to have got through that and handle things as well as he did. And uh, I've got a lot of time for Steve. And uh, I know he's not the flavour of the month in Newcastle, but um, I still think he's, he's a very good man. Yeah, and um, you mentioned about the uh, stamping. Uh, in the playoff final um, and football's always a game of fine margins um, and it's quite hard to compare to you know you look at your other jobs sort of at British Airways and you know how so how do those two jobs compare because you well not just that job in particular but you look at those two and think football's a game of fine margins and one deflected goal or like you say that red, red card that wasn't could have been the difference. Well, you're right. There really is no comparison. Um, it's football is bizarre, and it's you know, I've been in around 20 years now in terms of uh, the whole football situation. And you're absolutely right. A deflected free kick, an 88th minute deflected free kick, can change a three-year business plan straight away. Uh, mm -hmm. It is unlike anything else. The most important thing I think about being in my position as a chief executive is to be able to handle the bizarre and quick twists and turns that football throws at you. And that comes from experience, whether it's misbehavior of players that you never can see coming out of the blue. I mean, I, I get phone calls at two in the morning about uh, somebody that shouldn't be somewhere they, they were and doing something they shouldn't have been before big games. You get all those sort of calls. Then you get injuries, you get um, staff that you know, have all sorts of personal issues. There's never a dull moment, you know, either it's fans at you, whether it's agents, there's a lot of conflict and uh, it's just 24-7. And as you say, things taking completely different twists and turns. Uh, but that's part of the, the great fun of doing it. But it's also helping to have experience to see a lot of these things and to understand how to handle them as they, go, as they happen to you. Yeah, and one um, topic that springs to mind when you're talking about the conflict with players there is Ross McCormack. Is Anything that you could add about the time during his time at the club? No, I won't really. I can't really say too much about that, other than it's probably the most egregious display of professionalism that I think I've, I've ever seen in in, uh, in, a, in a player that I've had to handle in in my time. Uh, I would have, you know, if possible, I would offend every potential way to terminate contracts, but the contracts are written in such a way that it's very hard legally to do it. I did bring in experts and QCs even to try and find a way because I thought he was just, uh, his behaviour was just reprehensible. Um, but I won't go into any of the details. Mm. And moving on then, um, how do you feel you left Villa? Um, there was, obviously there's always a lot of talk about um, what happened between you and Mr Joya. But then also, I hear you got a lot of thank you letters from Aston Villa fans. It was, I mean, I... I'd, must say I had a fantastic relationship with all the fans that I'd got to meet and I really enjoyed the club and I still have a very soft spot for the club and also all the staff that are at Villa Park. Uh, I thought they were great and I really put my heart and soul into the club and I really did love it and wished I was still there today. However, um, the way it ended was bizarre. Um, ja had, you know, obviously run out of money and mm. he was just trying to find somebody to blame and uh, I became a bit of a scapegoat in that. Uh, that there has been since then legal positions that have been taken and settlements agreed, uh, I think, and the club have come out and made a statement that I'd acted at all times in the best interests of the club. So I was very pleased with that statement. Um, however, I saw today in the news that there's another warrant out for the arrest of Jia in China. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of, that, I think that sort of sums it up. So uh, I think I could just leave it there as to uh, let people decide the rights and wrongs. I would always hope one day for all the facts to come out. I would welcome that, but legally at the moment we're not uh, we're not able to do that. How good is it 
as a football fan, you mentioned at the start, to see both Aston Villa and, of course, your former club, Everton, in those top half uh, spots in the Premier League. It's fantastic. I mean, I think at, right at the start, there was, I think we were one and two, I think, at one stage, one week in the season so far. Uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel the Everton game last Sunday, or postpone it anyway, uh, from last Sunday. Of course, I always think about it as the Wyness Derby. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's great. Now, listen, they're both fantastic clubs. I think both fans appreciate they've got such similar heritages and um, they've got both you know, the history and the proper fan bases that are uh, very similar and great people. So, look, you know, I wish them both the, the best. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be heavily involved in both clubs at great times. And uh, I just hope in one sense I've left Villa in a better place than than I found it. And that, um, unfortunately, it all ended too soon for me, but that wasn't my, uh, my decision. And uh, as I say, I'm so pleased for the present owners. I think they're doing a great job. And uh, I'm really chuffed for the fans that they've got people that really are investing and that they care. I only wish I'd had a chance to work with them. I think we could have made something very special at Villa. And um, anyway, I, I, that, that's what I'd like to just uh, say at that, to that uh, point. Yeah, and just very finally... Um, is there any talk or anything on the cards of you returning to football? I, I know you've been involved in a few few bids in the last year or so, is that correct? Yeah, the, the, I work with some investor groups from America and we've been looking at a few different things, Jude. So uh, obviously we, we're not going to say anything before they happen, but yeah, there's mm. a couple of uh, premiership clubs that we've been uh, looking at and we'll just have to wait and see if those things can happen. It's uh, As you said, in football, anything can happen. And it's the same with buying a club as well. Uh, all sorts of weird things can happen around that so we'll just have to wait and see but with the right owners I would love to uh, to come back and uh, use my experience to help uh, help a club go forward Yeah, let's see if you can add to another wine of Derby, eh? <laughs> let's hope so, that would be good Okay, <laughs> Keith, it's been a pleasure to um, have a chat with you and um, thank you so much for taking your time to speak to me I'm sure Villa yeah. fans will find this so intriguing and um, yeah, thanks for taking time to speak to me Thank you Jude and good luck with your career Thank you. Um, guys, if you liked the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you're brand new, and don't forget to turn on your personal notifications. Until next time, goodbye and up with them. Hit the subscribe button and follow my journey to the media world. Click the video choices on screen to see more of my work.